smells like those <laughs> those chocolates so... that I try to avoid. Yeah, it literally smells <laughs> like the orange chocolate. You know what <laughs> I'm talking about. Oh, well, now we get my father-in-law a chocolate orange every year. But then, you know, I was a big fan of C's Candy. I grew up in Northern California. So and we would get the mixed chocolates. But we'd also take a, always take a little paring knife and cut them down the middle. Because if you got an orange or a raspberry, you just wanted to leave that one for someone else. Yeah, this is that in, in Scotch more Nasty. I'm going to see if Luck Fine is in our, um, in our book. Well, hello, well, everyone, we... and welcome to The Common Room. As you have heard, we are trying a new scotch. This was a gift from Andrew for Christmas. Look how light that is, guys. We chose it because it's so light. <laughs> There's not a scotch that's that light. So this is what we're going to be trying today. And... This is called normal color. This is this color. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I've had white wines that were darker than this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm so intrigued, but I'm excited. You guys ever heard that concept explore versus exploit? It's a deep reinforcement AI concept, but it also feels off. You mean Lewis's um, idea about receiving rather than using? You mean Ted Lasso's concept about being curious rather than being judgmental? Which he gets from Lewis's comment of receiving rather than using? (laughs) I'm I'm more in the other one, but it's, it's the idea that in life we're constantly taking information. So let's use restaurants as a perfect example. You learn, well, actually, let's use scotch. You've drank in scotches and you probably developed two or three you've really liked. So you can just go the rest of your life exploiting those three. And you know you like them. But if you never explore a certain amount, you will never find out there could be another one that's equally as good or better or one you enjoy. But if you explore all the time, you're going to stumble across a lot of bad ones too. So in AI with deep reinforcement learning as it's training, it, it starts to find a path that seems to be rewarding it. So it goes down that path, but every once in a while it needs to explore if there's a, a, a that's a, a local minimum when it's optimizing in the gradient descent or if there's a better one. And so it goes and explores. Nope. And it comes back. Nope. Comes back. Oh, wait, this path might be more optimal. So this, so I, I share that because I, my personality is I'm a little bit more open to exploring. I actually don't mind if I go to a bad restaurant, the idea for me of exploring, I get joy out of the concept of exploring itself rather than the outcome. So I'm excited to try this just for the sake of it is so left tail extreme of something <laughs> I haven't had before with this. <laughs> so I'm going to read the tasting notes on this, the Loch Fine chocolate and orange liqueur. For English people, it does taste like a, it smells like a cher- Terry's chocolate orange. But the notes mm-hmm. say, made with natural flavors oh. of chocolate, tangerine, and orange, with deluxe Scotch whiskey at its core, this liqueur is a modern twist on an old favorite. Heading from In- In- Inveray on the shores of Loch Fyne, this sweet delight makes for a fantastic treat, sipped neat or poured over ice cream. I'm poured keeping some of this for ice. the ice cream. Yeah, oh. and... Uh... What's yeah. the old fr- favorite that it's a twist of? Because <laughs> I'm curious I'm what that not is. Sure. Well, yeah. Cheers, gentlemen. What, what we're, but we're being judgmental, guys. Let's be curious. <laughs> cheers. You know, yeah, it's, it's not, it doesn't taste at all like scotch. I don't know why it's classified by <laughs> the scotch. It's a liqueur. <laughs> But it was better than I was expecting. If you take out the category of scotch and don't even put this in the whiskey scotch category, it's a good liqueur. I would, I would, I would drink this as a dessert liqueur, <laughs> <laughs> like a port oh. wine. This is like the port wine of scotch, guys. This no, scotch. no, no. That's to disgrace both port wine and scotch. Two <laughs> wonderful pleasures. This is just awful. <laughs> Yeah. I'm glad I'm that you get to share it with now. us, Andrew. <laughs> I, I, I disagree. I don't think this is awful. Hmm. If I take away the scotch thing, I would totally enjoy this with like a chocolate cake at the end of a fancy restaurant. Oh, gosh. No. Terry's chocolate orange. That's what this is. No, no. It's, it's a cherry, Terry's chocolate orange has got more integrity to the chocolate <laughs> <laughs> and less <laughs> artificiality to the orange. No, it just takes like one of those candy creams. Oh, <laughs> David, you got such good YouTube shorts out of this. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, so good. yeah. Well, Sorry Andrew, about the now, that you, listeners. 
<laughs> well, Andrew, now that you have cleansed your palate, um, the first thing on the agenda for today is for you just to share a little bit about your ordination day, because that happened well, since we last recorded. And this is an incredible yes. thing. I mean, we haven't actually talked about that as much. We've mentioned it on the yeah. podcast, but I mean, this is a huge commitment, offering yourself to the Lord and giving yourself to his ministry and administering the sacraments and healing individuals and being a conduit of his grace. Oh, my gosh. Well, may all those things be somehow true of me. Um, <laughs> Good answer. It was, it was a, a, an incredible experience, and it's two and a half weeks on. I've celebrated uh, the Eucharist, I think, nine times, ten times mm. um, now. Um, and it's. I was surprised at how much it felt like Oh, this is where I've been heading to. Now I'm where I belong. And although, mm -hmm. as I was you know, chatting with you guys before the show, um, there's so many pieces of the liturgy that I don't know how to do skillfully and well. It's like I'm shuffling the bulletin and the prayer book and the missal and you know, or the, you know, the altar book. Um, it just, it feels so natural to be up there. Um, and it's, I mean, I've been aiming towards this. I started pursuing vocation in 2018. Mm. Uh, I went to my first weekend in February of 2018 and began kind of exploring whether this was the thing and conceiving this whole thing. And now to finally enter into the vocation was just a, just a remarkable thing. And I'm still kind of reeling from, from the implications of it. Uh, the actual event was great. I had a lot of family and friends come in from around the country. Um, my favorite professor, Dr. Kate Sonderrager, um, amazing theologian was our preacher that night and preached a ridiculous sermon. Um, and people were so lovely and then very generous. And so I have, um, I have been gathering priesty things, all of which are expensive. Um, but I just ordered a what couple some of oil things? stocks. Um, yeah. so like vestments, um, like the mm -hmm. chasuble, the big cape and the stole, a stole itself is two or $300. Um, easily. Mm. And that's a steal. And I, uh, yeah, I'm going to wear it. Like I stole it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, but folks the are, were incredibly generous. Um, and my rector is going to give me his old set of, of, um, of vestments, um, because they just got some new ones. So that's a, a huge benefit. I got an oil stock, which is, you know, when the, when you go for a healing, um, and, the oil in the oil, the oil for chrism, um, for chrismation, when somebody becomes a Christian or somebody's baptized, that has to be blessed by our bishop. Mm -hmm. But the oil for healing, I can bless because I now, as a priest, have the ability to bless, bless it. So I ordered a little bottle of oil from um, uh, from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it's a bottle nice. of olive oil yeah. from Israel, and I poured it into That's the cool. cotton ball in the stock, and I blessed it, and now it's holy oil. Um, can, can I ask so, you a question, Andrew? <clears throat> besides the one you just asked me? No, yeah. Just the one. <laughs> Go ahead. Be many more. Okay. It's someone who obviously th this is meant more is, is I got a curiosity of how you, uh, you would answer this question because I get presented this a lot coming from a yeah. denomination, very similarly sacramental based and mm -hmm. structure and liturgy, you know, why? why do we need the sacraments? Why do we need all of this structure, this liturgy, this framework? Like, isn't Christianity just a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Like I get that all the time as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I actually have an answer that I've, I've kind of developed, but I'm curious you being very intimate with this and now being an administer of the sacraments and the graces that come through that. And it's not necessarily that the graces only come through that, but there is a special role we believe from that and what, and why is that the case? Where, 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 what, what would be your yeah, defense Yeah, why the of that? liturgy? Why the sacramental life? Um, yeah. And I grew up in no faith at all. And then when I came to faith, I was, uh, you know, of different, different denominations of evangelical. Um, I call myself an Episcopaptocostatarian. Um, <laughs> but I found myself hungry for more God. And so all I need is a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, do you not need your Bible? And they would probably say, well, yes, I need my Bible. Well, where did the Bible come from? The Bible came from the church. 
it was, you know, the, it was, they were the early councils of the church. that gave us the scripture. It's the early councils of the church that gave us the Trinity, the understanding of Christ. Um, and so there's a long history on which even the most personalized and evangelical faith depends whether or not they acknowledge it. Um, and so for me, uh, part of, part of this kind of moving towards a liturgical and sacramental life, um, came from this kind of, for me anyway, it felt a little shallow or a little empty to just have it be me and my Bible and my personal Jesus, right? And my interpretation of the Bible began to have too much authority. And uh, we need tradition. We need the authority of others, of faithful people. My wife, um, who also is similarly um, late to the Episcopal Church and kind of a, kind of an Abapticostatarian as well, um, says that sometimes I don't even know what to pray extemporaneously. And so to have the prayers that have been written by faithful saints for and used by the faithful for hundreds of years, there's something reliable about knowing that I can pray words that I know are going to be true and not heretical or misinformed or ignorant just because I made them up myself. I love extemporaneous prayer mm -hmm. and it's important. But our emphasis on the Bible and my own personal relationship is the byproduct of history. And so if you look at the Reformation, you see the Reformation is in some ways corrective of the abuses of the establishment church. And then the Council of Trent does a similar thing to kind of make some of those corrections. Um, and in some ways, I think that there can be overcorrections. I also am aware that the majority of Christians alive right now are Roman Catholic. There's 1.3 billion in the world. And the majority of Christians throughout time have been Roman Catholic. And then if you add in Anglicans and Orthodox, a majority of Christian expression throughout history has been liturgical and has been sacramental. All of that said, we know that our Lord um, instituted the sacrament of the Eucharist and that our Lord acknowledged and instituted baptism. These are the dominical sacraments, the sacraments from our Lord, from the Dominus. Um, and he said to do this in remembrance of me. And so when I stand before the people and I turn this wafer and wine into the somehow mystically, who knows how, the body and blood of Christ, I'm following him and doing what he told us to do. And I serve as this kind of intersection point between eternity and history and between mm. the spiritual and the physical. I am not a God's priest bringing everybody before the Lord. I don't have that kind of power, nor would I want it. But I get to be this kind of focal point where this, this gift that God gave us, the Holy Meal, the Eucharist, the, the, the communion, has to be administered. And it's ad been traditionally administered in this way. And serving and preaching and healing, you know, I get to be part of kind of stitching up a broken world. And that's just mm -hmm. a real joy. And so I've been surprised at how well those vocations fits. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> no, well, and it, it makes me think of so much to Lewis and mere Christianity, where he goes, God created the material. He likes the material. And so using <laughs> a material thing like the Eucharist to in, in sacraments themselves to transmit the, the, the kind of non-material, his graces makes perfect sense. And sometimes something that I've always thought of too is just because he did it this way, doesn't mean it has to necessarily, it had to be this way. Maybe he did it because it's for our benefit. Like, could he have given his graces in a thousand other ways? Absolutely. But when I walk into the confessional and I walk out, I like, I feel something, something has happened. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different than when I just ask for God's forgiveness. I'm still asking for God's forgiveness constantly in my own personal prayer. Cause Lord knows I need it every single day, but there's times where I go into the confessional and I just need to experience that, that sacrament of the confessional, mm -hmm. um, in the Eucharist, of course, I'm experiencing his graces through my prayer life and through reading scripture. Uh, but when I go and receive that Eucharist, you know, every so often I like get tears of mm -hmm. just what's happening in that moment and the gift of that. And so sometimes I'm, I, when the people ask me, I'm like, part of it is for our own benefit. I think like he just mm -hmm. knows we're material creatures. Lewis says our body posture affects our prayer. It's a material, physical type of thing. Like oh, he knows how we are formed. He remembers how we are yeah. made. The Psalm says, <laughs> yep. And for me, my, my own priesthood 
which allows me to absolve, meaning to declare God's forgiveness. I don't forgive people's sins, but I get to declare God's forgiveness. I get to bless and offer a blessing and I get to consecrate, you know, consecrate the host. Um, my priesthood in even in doing those things arises from my baptism and arises from the priesthood of all believers, right? And so while I believe something special and vocational has happened to me, while I believe that there's an ontological change in me because I am now a priest, um, that comes from the way that Christ shares his own priesthood with mortals, right? He could have said, this is the sacrament and I'm going to leave some special and you can find it, you know, here that I may, but he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so he invites us to participate in the materiality and the spirituality that are embedded in the sacraments. And there's something about the whole of me that really resonates with that. Hmm. Well, that was all very serious. So we need to mix this up a little bit. So uh, Matt, can you give me a number between one and 250? 11. Oh boy. 11. Okay. So this is being released on Valentine's day. So we are going to be speed dating. So <laughs> I have a list of speed dating questions and number 11 is who do you admire most? And I'm going to save our blushes and say, you can't choose either myself or Andrew. Go. <sighs> who do I admire most? Remember you can't say either me or Andrew. That's just, that's off the table. Right. Although that you want don't, to, don't, don't by worry. the way, he called it uh, speed dating. <laughs> problem is this isn't going to be a perfect answer because without enough time thinking Good. we don't edit this. this so, okay. um, should we take Jack Lewis and, and <laughs> Jesus off the table as well? <laughs> yes. Okay. I would have allowed this. Back, Can we I make those all to... be given? <laughs> I keep going back to, uh, uh Henry Nowen. There head. we go. That's who I thought you would mm. say. Mm. Uh, yeah, I okay. really admire his. And here's what I admire about him. And, and this will tell you a little bit something about myself, too. I believe truth is is closer to black and white in, in a lot of areas. I think I think there's right and wrong. And I think a lot of that is that. And I think this world kind of gets away from that a little bit. But what I think is a little bit messier is the way you love people and bring truth to people. And I, and if I, I look at the world today, there's like people who either think truth is just all completely gray and just want to muddle it. And there's those that think it's black and white. But then if you think it's black and white, you assume everyone has to follow it black and white. It was like people's lives and stories are messy and broken. Mm -hmm. And I think I love on golden pond where, uh, if you've ever seen, that's one of, I love that movie when she goes, sometimes you have to look at a person and know that they're doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're all struggling in some ways, shape or form. And so I guess what I'm going with this is Henry Nowen's resources seem to be so compassionate and gentle towards the individual and understanding their brokenness and uh, at, while at the same time calling them up to something better without making them feel judged for falling short of that better. And he seems very human. Like I, I consider him as good as C.S. Lewis at communicating truth that's receivable and non-judgmental, but you aspire to be a part of it. Like, I love that. And so I really admire Henry now and his journey, his vulnerability, uh, mm. all that. Mm. I love it. There you go. <laughs> Andrew, what about you, David? A number one, I, this is not oh. how this is working. <laughs> oh, pick a number. Oh, okay, great. Andrew, uh, you have to pick a number between one and 250. 247. Okay, 247. Uh, do you prefer letters or emails? Ah, I prefer emails because I wish that I wrote more letters. Um, but for me as a, as a, uh, a digital immigrant, um, or maybe a digital naturalized citizen, um, emails allow this kind of quickness of response. Um, and so, I mean, as you know, I think I've mentioned before, part of my vocational process has brought me into the orbit of Rowan Williams, the amazing Anglican theologian. And I emailed him the day I started my vocational process and 
I emailed him right before I was ordained and he sent me a prayer that he wrote for me. I mean, I love the way that email can be immediate. It's formal enough that it can have some, some writing that a text can't write. Um, letters, um, to me just feel like an obligation and I'm a lousy correspondent. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to, I'm going to call it nobler than it is that I have a Lewisian loathing of letters, <laughs> you know, but uh, mostly it's just because I never I'm lazy. respond. <laughs> So bad. Also, I don't respond to email, so. I never said a word. Uh, I, would, I, would have, I would have said emails just because I hate having to read cursive. It's like, oh, it's so difficult. Oh, <laughs> People who do write letters tend to use cursive. And beautiful. Although listeners, I have just, uh, I just received today 144 pen nibs, which I believe are the same ones that Lewis used. And I've got a pen stick and I have a parishioner who's making me another pen. And I actually have been buying up notebooks that look like the ones that Lewis used and just been to experiment with sitting down and writing bits for my Till We Have Faces book. Just in, um, I have none left. In... You've already referenced Till We Have Faces and you did a show and tell <laughs> and I've got nothing to drink. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, that's your fault. Who did you think that you were, you were hanging out with? Dude? You I should know. have been well stocked. There's got to be supply. a teeny bit left in here. So yeah, well, you have actually, another orange. Speaking speaking of vocation, I do find it funny that you started your process in 2018, which was only shortly after we began Pints with Jack. It was actually oh, probably around the time that you did the name change. So I'm not oh, saying that you would... misinterpreted your vocation, but this is what you were really being called to. Just saying. No, I, I, it, it helped to fulfill my vocation. <laughs> but that's also part of it. I mean, one of the things I'm so excited about with vocation is to see what priestliness can bring to my work as a Lewis scholar. You know, and to mm -hmm. see how those things come together. I know my diocese is asking me to write something about Lewis and uh, teach something about Lewis, but I also can't wait to see what I can do to bring theology and priestliness and vocation and and all of that to to the Lewis world. I think that, and I've seen a shift. Um, I've seen a, a shift in me. Brittany White um, and I chatted about that some when we we visited not long ago. So here's to Brittany. <laughs> I will give you a hundred dollars if you turn up at church one Sunday with a giant bird's head on your chest. Who's the priest of Blime? That reference? Who, yeah, the no, priest I, of Blime. I got that. Yes. No, no, it has to be your church. Yeah, you can't tell it for somebody not. else's. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, can we finance the, the bird's mask through Patreon? Uh, if you're willing to wear it, sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Halloween is coming. Okay. I'm going to choose number 37. Which is, what is your idea oh, of relaxing? Should... Oh, you want to choose my number? Okay, go ahead. Choose my number. Yes. Yes. 68. 68. What is your favorite childhood memory? Ooh. He's going to choose the lion one. <clears throat> I... Favorite childhood memory. I'm torn. From my day-to-day -day childhood memory, it would be sitting in the bath, having the Chronicles of Narnia read to me by oh. my mother. But if I had to choose one generally, the image that popped into my head was when we went on a family trip to Mallorca, which is one of the Spanish islands. I must have been about eight at the time. And we spent two weeks there. It was absolutely beautiful. I swam every day. The food was amazing. Wow. And I remember on the final night, my dad, as we were sitting on the deck chairs on the pier underneath the stars, speaking about how beautiful everything was. And I started to cry and I told him to stop talking because he was making me cry at the beauty of everything. Oh, I think that one's got to be right up there. Wow. It's that's funny. a toy garden. You mm. know, David, you speak of a vacation. <clears throat> we, we joked about at the episode we recorded just before this, how I seem to have three celebrity crushes on British women. Maybe this goes back to when I'm 12. It's a really great vacation. <laughs> I also have a very positive memory of Antigua, our family went to. And I met this British. Um, I was literally 12 years old. I met this little British uh guy my age too he was 12 we're both prepubescent <laughs> and uh we're just drinking virgin pina coladas all day because it's all inclusive resort and him and i became close friends that trip we hung out all day long we played this there's ping pong at the resort and we're just literally playing ping pong all day long and i'll never forget that his name was alex <clears throat> i love the accent and uh then i tried calling alex uh, to become friends later, not to understand the concept of a time zone difference. And so <laughs> I think I called him at like his parents wake up, it's 2 a.m. <laughs> because this was also <laughs> landline day. So you, when you call landline, it did, there was no do not disturb. Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's funny you say that. One of my favorite memories is hmm. Antigua. 
Anyway, sorry. Love that. Well, Matt, give us another number. 13, Taylor Swift's favorite number. <laughs> okay. Are you a possessive person? Yes. Okay. Okay. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, give me a number. Uh, 176. 176. What is an extreme activity you want to do? Oh, man. I always thought about jumping out of an airplane. Oh, I want to do that too. Let's do it together, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, my wife wouldn't let me anymore. Oh. You know? But um, she doesn't have yeah, to know. I thought about, thought about <laughs> doing that. And, um, you know, we've all had our dreams of flying. Um, and, of course, you can't do it solo until you do a ton of training. And I had a friend who was going no, to take to me do up for high. my 50th birthday. So high. Um, and uh, and that didn't that Nothing. work out. And I don't know. Um, that's just that's something that I thought about doing. I like it. I might splice into this video a little bit of me doing my skydiving. It was terrifying. Oh, <laughs> do it, do it, do it, David. Let's do it. I'm not doing it again. It's terrifying. All right, no. give me a number for myself. Eighty-two. Eighty-two. What place do you most want to explore? I'm Rivendell. in Asia. Hmm. Asia. I've, I had one, one layover in Japan for 24 hours and I really liked it, mm -hmm. but I would really like to uh, explore, uh, the, the continent in general. Okay. Um, Matt? what order, hmm? Wh which country would um, you go to first? Probably Japan and then head into mainland China. Yeah. China was, be, I guess. China was amazing. Hmm. Yeah, great food. Twenty-two. Right, Matt, next number for your Taylor Swift. Swift. I'm feeling twenty-two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you work out? <laughs> oh boy, a lot. I run f quite frequently, uh, like five, six miles, a few times a week. I weight lift. I started to push myself hard there, a few times a week, and I like to Peloton a few times a week. And ladies, he is single. Send me a message at contact at I'm sure that's a good, I'm yeah, sure that's a good thing or not. I've year. heard the ladies are attracted to the dad bod. I don't know. <laughs> <where they're> <laughs> I think Matt needs to give up singleness for Lent. I agree. <laughs> if anyone knows Andrew, how to fix that, email me. I've been doing that for years. <laughs> I mean, that's been like my New Year's revolution is giving that up. <laughs> Dry January. doesn't work. <laughs> Andrew, what's your number? Oh, let's do number one. Okay. Ooh. Oh, that's a good one. How do your friends describe you in a word? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm going to morph the question though. When I give talks, the word that keeps coming back again and again is passionate. Mm -hmm. I would have chosen the word enthusiastic. Enthi okay. I would have said empathetic. Um, empathetic? Yeah, you're very, okay. you're very, or relatable, which are kind of similar to some degree, but I mean, empathetic's a little bit different than mm. relatable, but you meet someone okay. where they're at very well. Wow. Okay. I'll take that. This is, this is lovely on Valentine's Day. <laughs> We're being so affirming. Uh, oh, <laughs> and yes. with that in mind, give me a number for me. 212. 112. Oh, two. I, I like two. Go two. That's a good one. Two. Uh, are you sure? Yes. Okay. So does read two one. and read 112. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Um, number two is, do you like to call or text? Absolutely. Text. Oh, I you're an introvert. You like point to text. In... Yeah. It's, I, I have a, I have a question. Send me back a response. You have a question. I'll look at it. I'll send you back a reply. There's no need for lots of hi. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Blah. Get rid of all of that I stuff. Very rarely text. Get to the point. <laughs> I'm a caller. One of the things as an extrovert that I've learned is that if I want to reach out to my introvert friends to text before I call. Yeah. And so I think I've trained them so well that if I'm calling, 
it's because it's not because I don't know that they're introverts and answering mm -hmm. the phone is an enormous Herculean act of courage, <laughs> but it's, you know, incredibly important. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I call everyone randomly out of the blue and I just leave them a voicemail. I say, Oh, give me a call. I'm free these times. Love to catch up. <laughs> well, let's, let's turn? do one more round. Matthew, sure. your final number, please. How, how high could this go? The last one, whatever the 250. highest number was. 251, actually. That one. That one. You want 251? References. Yeah. Uh, would you rather be hairy or baldy? Bald. Really? If you're if you're bald and cut, and, you know, really in shape, because I like to go to the gym, I would try to probably get a little more cut than I am now. I feel like that's better than like super hairy. Yeah, but then you get to pretend to be Chewbacca. Which is amazing. That doesn't sound good at all. I just saw some <laughs> video of Peter Mayhew doing Chewba Chewbacca's lines because that's how they filmed it. He read the dialogue so that the <laughs> actors would know how to respond. It was frightening. <laughs> so, it was frightening. All right, Andrew, your number, please. Uh, number seven. Okay. Number seven is the page has gone. Completely blank. That's not helpful. Let's try it refreshing that. Okay, here we go. Number okay. seven, <laughs> whiskey or beer? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. There's a really, really easily clear answer to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a good one, Andrew. Um, you know, I mean, some of my best fellowship with um, some of my friends, my best friend who I lived with in Nashville, my relationship with Phil, um, a, a pint, you know, having a pint and the last line of Out of the Silent Planet, a pint of bitter, please. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the that's the the food of love. Um, so but then also for, I think, kind of deeper enjoyment. I mean, how many drams have I enjoyed with you guys, with with uh, with Malcolm, with with Cherry Root? And so there's there's a kind of price um, associated with good whiskey. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to say both in different circumstances. All right. For the last one, give me a number. Ninety four. Was that full? Ninety four. 94. Okay. It's interesting, Matt. You said 112 and I said two. And you said 94 and I was thinking about four. <laughs> We've been podcasting together for too long. I told you you're relatable, empathetic. You're just feeling me right now. <laughs> uh, what do you do to feel good? Get up early, make myself a cup of tea. Go for a walk around our neighborhood. That's, that's, that's my favorite mm -hmm. thing. Well, it's still nice and quiet before everyone's woken up and started making a, a, a racket in the world. I think that's one of my favorite yeah. things. Oh, lovely. Do you have a walking Beautiful. stick? I don't. I you gifted my Camino walking stick to my mother after I completed it. Uh, oh. And I'm not that old yet. Yeah. But if I did, I would get one like Chesterton. When Marie and I went to Oxford and got to handle all of Chesterton's stuff, his hat, his cape, and his canes, he had several sword canes that were mm. awesome. So yeah, if I ever have a cane, look out. It's going to have a sword inside. Yeah, I think I may one day do a little research into what kind of stick Lewis used and, you know. I'm sure it would come across as an affectation, but by the time I have the pipe and the pen and all the rest, you know, and the tweeds and the <laughs> ink all over my hands, you know, maybe it will, uh, maybe it'll fit. Well, viewers, well, I happy hope Valentine's you've enjoyed Day to this our time listeners. Speed dating with us. Yes, and they pray with that the love glasses. of God pervades your lives. What's that? Yeah, I was going to say with our empty with glasses. our empty glasses. Let's. That's with yeah. Mine was yep, empty. All the remnants of that the Terry's chocolate orange. Nasty bit out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, gentlemen. Well, let, let me pray for you all. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Lord, we just ask that love, love from you, and love in all of its forms would surround the lives of our listeners and with us. Help us to forget ourselves and to go out of ourselves towards each other. 
Help us to fulfill the law of Christ by loving one another. And let your love, the height, the depth, the undescribable greatness and grandeur of your love invade our lives every day through Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. 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 Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.